Welcome to What's for Lunch, conversations about trends and trade in food and egg and how it all affects what's on your plate. This podcast brings important information in a unique way, relevant to food businesses, farmers, and consumers, unique in that it approaches these issues from a different angle. I'm Susan Burns, your lunchtime host and on-call business lawyer. Our motto is always interesting, always lively. Today is absolutely no exception to that. We are talking with Blue Owl, Pre Owl Preserves founder and owner, Katie Cizo. Katie has an incredibly interesting story. She began making jam in college so she could preserve locally grown foods for enjoyment throughout the year. And now she's selling in Whole Foods. There were a lot of twists and turns along the way, as you can imagine, and we're gonna explore some of those today starting with becoming a vegan while she was at Cornell University pursuing her degree in environmental engineering, a ritual she started and continued through pursuing her master's degree in environmental studies at the University of, of Colorado at Boulder, and through that to farmers markets, to, to mainstream retailers. It's been quite the ride and Katie's here to tell us about that. Welcome, Katie. Thanks so much for having me today, Susan. It's just such a pleasure. As I told you before we, we went live here, I so approve of your mission and I can't wait until we have your products in Minnesota, but I know I can buy them out online and I'll do that, but I'm getting ahead of myself. I want you to talk to us about your super interesting background. Um, first of all, you became a vegan while you were a junior in college is that right that's right yeah i um was a vegetarian for six years and then during college was just continuing to learn more about the ways our food you know our current agricultural system impacts the world around us and so i went vegan in an attempt to try and lower the impact that my food was going to have on the world around us um and so one of the things that I was not anticipating was how much harder it was going to be to eat out or eat at the dining halls. You know, my options were just a lot more limited as a vegan. And so that really is what prompted me to learn how to cook because I needed to still be able to feed myself. You got tired, um, you got tired of lettuce? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can only eat a plain salad, you know, so many days in a row before you're ready to, to switch it up. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's really what got me introduced to the Ithaca Farmers Market and to our local food co-op and was really my first introduction to local foods, you know, my first opportunities to actually chat with the farmers that were growing the produce that I was buying or chatting with the people about at the co-op about you know, the products that they were sourcing. And so it was my opportunity to learn more about, you know, where my food was coming from, how it was being produced, um, and how I could make the best decisions, both for me in terms of my health, but then also in terms of my environmental impact. And so this started while you were pursuing your, your um, four-year degree at Ithaca, at Cornell yes. in Ithaca, correct? Is that right? Correct. Yeah. And you were studying environmental engineering then, and yeah. exposed you to a lot of information on how the food industry and major corporations impact small-scale producers and the environment, I imagine. Yes. I think one of the great things about being a student at Cornell is they bring in so many you know, guest speakers who are experts in their field. Um, so I remember hearing Temple Grandin talking and um, you know, she's a big name within sort of animal liberation and animal rights. Um, and then kind of in line with what we're talking about today, I remember going to a film um, screening that looked at the impact that some major corporations, places like Monsanto and DuPont, we're having on you know the future viability of small scale family farms within the country and again that was just a really eye opening opportunity to learn more about how agriculture in the united states was changing and how i could make decisions with the food that i was eating to more support 
um, the type of agriculture that I wanted to see. So I took that as an opportunity to, you know, vote with my dollar every time I was buying food to try and support those farmers that are, um, you know, producing locally or producing using organic methods or producing in a way with uh, sustainability in mind so that um, I could help, yeah, ensure the, the success of small scale local and family farms into the future instead of kind of that, that trend towards larger scale production and um, industrial agriculture. You are singing my song, sister. <laughs> I knew we were gonna, gonna get along. <laughs> well, and so you did what I think is a really interesting thing uh, after you became a vegan and, and started this journey on, on looking at local farmers markets and studying local farmers and, and voting with your dollars, you started a weekly dinner for your friends. Yeah, so this was during my senior year in college. I was starting to get the hang of vegan cooking. And, um, you know, growing up, I feel like my dad really instilled in me that idea of showing love through food. So being able to feed people good, healthy food is a way of showing love. And so I started a, a weekly Sunday dinner where friends would come over. Um, I would prepare like a four or five course vegan dinner. I would go all out with wow. you know, appetizers and entrees and desserts. Um, and it was just such a wonderful opportunity to bring together all the people that I love spending time with and getting to feed them good food and nutritious food. Um, I'll always remember one of my friends, Gideon, telling me that it was the best meal that he ate each week. And that felt so good to know that I was helping to, to nourish my friends. Um, and then when I went off to grad school, I continued doing that. Um, I actually did an independent study project where I put together a vegan cookbook that highlighted local seasonal ingredients. So each recipe was crafted around a particular ingredient. Um, and so to test all of those recipes, I'd, again, have friends over each weekend so that we could all sit down together around the table and enjoy, enjoy a meal together. Um, okay, Katie, I know that uh, it's not a small task to prepare a four or five course vegan dinner. And I think vegan cooking takes a little extra love and attention, at least. I'm probably not as as well versed in it as you are, but for me, it takes a lot of extra time. How did you, how did you, man? I mean, that's really a dedication and a commitment to keep doing that all through graduate school. How did you manage all that? I think it really was just deciding that food was something that was important to me. Um, even during undergrad, you know, recognizing that I had limited dollars to spend on things, and I was prioritizing spending those on you know, healthy food and local food and organic food, while I could have been spending that on other things. And then the same thing goes with my time. There certainly were other things that I could have done with my time, but I was prioritizing, um, yeah, prioritizing food, prioritizing cooking and, and feeding that food to other people. Um, but yes, it certainly, there definitely were weeks where it was a challenge and it was like, oh my gosh, how am I supposed to get all of this done with everything else that's on my plate? Um, but yeah. It's, so it's a commitment. It's a, it's a choice and a commitment. Exactly. Yeah. I actually, uh, one of my friends frequently says, well, I can't, because you know, I vote with my dollars as well. Um, and she frequently says, well, I can't afford that as she's on her way to the golf course. <laughs> exactly. It's all about just deciding what your priority is. And. Mm -hmm. I know, yeah. I've never said a word to her and I know she won't, I'm in no danger of her listening to this podcast, so <laughs> <laughs> she won't be offended. No. Uh, but you, uh, go ahead, sorry. I was going to say, I think that's just an important thing for people to think about of oftentimes we do have that excuse of it's too much time or it's too much money, but recognizing that, you know, there are ways that we can shift our time or shift how we're spending our money to support the things that we care the most about. And it really is just deciding whether something is a priority or not, and then aligning the rest of your life with that. Mm -hmm. I agree. Exactly. So, and actually I, it's important. I do think about that every time I make an excuse for something for myself. So it's, you know, we teach each other through our examples and I think what sticks 
with me about what somebody says is always an indicator of where I need to look at things in my own life. And so um, I'm, you know, and it, and it is, we all make choices with how we spend our days and our dollars, our, our resources are allocated according to our priorities. So you went from vegetarianism to veganism to now, and you started preserving food when you were in college because in Ithaca, you don't have food year round, like fresh grown food because there's a winter there. That's right. And so you started working on trying to preserve that and have it available for longer than just in season. Yeah. So yeah, it was really fun getting to learn different techniques for preservation. So whether that was just freezing or drying or canning food. Um, and so I explored a, a whole lot of those different methods. But jam just very quickly became my favorite thing to to make. Um, and so very quickly, that's where I was focusing more and more of my time. And I would make jam to give, you know, as holiday gifts or birthday gifts. And so all of a sudden started having a lot of jam around the house to to be able to share with people. At that time, um, did you envision yourself being in Whole Foods on the sh on the store shelf? No, <laughs> no, no. That was not even on my radar. Uh -huh. um, I did do one summer where you know I had enough friends who loved the jam and wanted to get some that I you know kind of had order forms at the beginning of the summer where everybody could tell me what they wanted so I knew how much to make but that was at the time as close as I ever thought it would be to to being a business I had you know no vision for kind of where I am today mm -hmm. you also worked on a farm for a summer or two didn't you I did, yeah. I volunteered with um, Black Cat Farm, which is an organic farm in Boulder, Colorado. And they're a really awesome organization. They have a gourmet restaurant in town. And they started with the restaurant and then realized that they wanted to have more control over where they were sourcing their ingredients and therefore started their own farm. And so they you know, grew produce, they raised livestock. And so I had the opportunity to volunteer with them both at the farm. So I would go out and help with, you know, planting or weeding or harvesting. Um, one of the fun things was always when the pigs would get out and we'd have to chase the <laughs> pigs around, try and get them back in their enclosure. <laughs> it, it was, that was always a challenge. They were crafty. <laughs> I can imagine. Uh, who can blame them? Yeah. <laughs> there was one news story about it. I think it was a cow that I don't know. He got out and walked like halfway around the world or something. No, I mean, it was like miles and miles and miles, but escaped and I guess was having a good time. I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who would blame them? Oh my. Well, okay. So you had all this interesting personal journey that, you know, and professional with your education that's leading you down you know, I think it's like a funnel that gets smaller and smaller that's leading you toward this path. How did you ever get to the thought that I think I'll try to sell my jam? Yeah. So as we were talking before we got started, I had moved out to Minnesota. My husband was doing his postdoc at the University of Minnesota. And so we were there for a year and a half. And then we got the opportunity to move back to Colorado. And so he had secured a job in Colorado Springs. And I didn't have anything lined up yet and wasn't quite ready to jump into a new full-time job and was kind of just thinking like, this is the perfect opportunity to try my hand at selling my jam. You know, I don't have anything else going on. It's not like I'm a very risk adverse person. So I wasn't going to leave a job to start a jam company, but not having one kind of gave me that opportunity. And so, my plan was to sell jam at a farmer's market for the summer and then come fall, I'd start, you know, kind of the search for my next full-time position. Um, long story short, four years later, here we are still going. Um, <laughs> so that was in this, that was in the summer of 2015 then. It was, yes. Oh, oh exactly. Four years. Yep. We yes. just celebrated our, our four year birthday at the end of May. 
Okay. And did you start out with a brand as Blue Owl Preserves? It was actually Katie's Creations, okay. which was kind of the catch-all name that I had used beforehand for all of my, my food mm -hmm. adventures. So when I was doing the dinners, I had a Facebook page called Katie's Creations where I would let everybody know what I was planning to make for that week. And um, Katie's Creations is what I had used on my labels, you know, when I was giving gifts. And so I just started with that name that first summer. Um, but once I had decided that I was going to continue and really turn this into a business, decided that I needed something more specific. Creations doesn't really tell you what I'm making, and I wanted customers to be able to see my name and immediately have an idea of what it was that I was offering. And so after very many months of trying to find the perfect name, um, ended up settling on Blue Owl Preserves. And you are now making exclusively uh, jams or fruit spreads. I am, yep. Okay, so Preserves is a good name for that and for a lot of other, I mean, it has a lot of other implications as well. And exactly, and that's really why I went with Preserves was because I felt like if down the road I wanted to expand to other products, they could still kind of fall under that Preserves umbrella. So I wanted to make sure I wasn't kind of backing myself into a corner with my name, mm -hmm. um, but would allow myself for future growth um, in the future if I wanted. I'm a big fan of that one. Mm -hmm. That's a good choice. And how did you come up with Blue Owl? I knew that I wanted to have a cute animal on my logo because when I buy wine, I often base my decision on whether or not there's an animal on their, their label. Okay. Um, <laughs> and so figured there must be some other people out there who that would work on. And owls were um, just one of my, my favorite animals. And I liked kind of blue owl since a blue owl isn't a thing that actually exists. And we kind of just went from there. Not a thing that existed until your your label came along. Exactly. <laughs> okay, so your did you so you did your first summer at the farmers market, and it must have gone well. It did. I was kind of blown away by the reactions that I got from my customers. You know, I I knew that my jam was tasty, but I just did not expect the the love and commitment from my my customers that I found that first summer. And that's really what pushed me to say like, hey, let's keep going with this. There's clearly an appetite for this product. People are looking for things like this. Um, you know, I'm not ready to walk away from it. Let's let's keep going. So what is it do you think that aside from your stunning personality, stunning and engaging <laughs> personality, what is it do you, that you think people liked and appreciated about your product and and what's different about your fruit spread than one I can that's already available on the market? Yeah. So the biggest difference is that all of my jams are lower in sugar. So a lot of store bought jams and even homemade jams have, you know, 12, 13 grams of sugar per serving. They're yeah. more sugar content than they are actually fruit content. And so my jams have only three grams of sugar per serving, so it's quite a bit less. Um, I started making it that way because I thought it tasted better. I liked the more uh, natural, the fresher flavor that you get with less sugar in there. Exactly. But ex yeah, I mean, fruit is already so sweet and delicious, so I want my jam to taste like that fruit, not just sugary sweet. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, so much of us are learning more about you know, the health impacts of our current levels of sugar consumption here in the United States. And so more and more of us are trying to find ways to cut sugar out of our diet. And I actually have a lot of customers who, when they'd first come up, they would say, oh, well, I don't eat jam anymore because there's too much sugar in there. Mm. But they missed it. You know, they they wanted to be able to eat jam, but they were trying to make, you know, a decision to benefit their health. And so for a lot of them, being able to find my product allowed them to still enjoy having, you know, some jam on their toast in the morning without worrying about all of that excess sugar that was in there. 
So that's really one of the, the key characteristics about my brand that's really brought people in and kept them coming back for more. What about the, the GMO, non-GMO aspect? Is that a factor in your product as well? Because I find that is, is, is an increasingly important aspect of food shopping. Yeah, great question. So I use only organic fruits in my jam, so they'll be non-GMO. Um, my product's not certified organic yet, just because I'm not quite at the point where I can afford that certification, but the ingredients that I'm using are organic. And that's something that has just remained important to me. You know, I choose organic when I'm out shopping. I wanna feel good about the product that I'm putting out into the world, and so organic, is what feels best you know that's the um that's what i want to be putting on people's plates and also again even as a business i'm still voting with my dollar and so i want to make sure that i'm continuing to support those organic farmers who for the most part are making better decisions um, in how they're growing their produce in a way that's going to benefit the environment and our health so a win 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 exactly the trifecta of wins. And then I also try to source locally as much as I'm able to. Um, you know, sourcing locally means our food travels fewer miles to get to us. And then also that's my way of helping to support our local food economy. One of the challenges though, as I'm beginning to scale up is trying to mm. continue to source as much locally um, in part because I just don't have the same amount of storage capacity to increase the amount that I'm getting locally. So that's a challenge that I'm still trying to figure out currently as I scale up. Yes, so that is one of the challenges of your business now. In it is, yeah. Every, grow, every business that starts taking off encounters challenges to growth. Yeah, and I would say sourcing has been one of the big ones that I've been been running into. Even just trying to source organic has been a lot harder than I was anticipating. Mm -hmm. um, and so, especially as kind of a smaller scale, I'm at kind of this awkward stage where, you know, I'm I'm too big to kind of keep buying from, you know, the the store, but I'm not big enough to work with a lot of suppliers. I'm not quite at the level that they're looking for. So I'm kind of at this awkward in-between stage, which is hard. The teen stage of business growth. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that ha and that happens with most businesses. There's that, there's that, every time there's a growth spurt, there's a, a really a, the resources issue. There's really a tug on resources, time, money, supply, um, whatever way it is did you so i kind of jumped here from farmer's market to to selling but so what happened you you had a successful summer at the farmer's market you said let's get going and so then how did you how did you start how did you change your name from katie creations and blue owl spread and start selling i assume you started a foray into retail or how did that journey yeah go? Yeah, so the first year again was just kind of not intended to be a long-term business. I was producing as a cottage food producer. Mm -hmm. So in Colorado, there's a variety of different products that you're able to produce out of your home kitchen and sell directly to customers. And so thankfully jam was one of those um, categories of food because that helped to really lower the cost of entry for me. Um, to get started because I didn't need to start immediately with renting kitchen space. In my second year, I wanted to expand to more and more farmers markets, expand you know, outside of just Colorado Springs. And I also started doing more events. I actually found that I sell really well at vintage markets for whatever reason. You know, that crowd is just, you know, excited to buy a handmade yeah food products um so i kind of expanded to a, a wider variety of still direct to customer sales but to a wider 
audience. Mm -hmm. And then during that time also transitioned into a commercial kitchen. So out of my home kitchen and into a commercial kitchen, which was a key step in being able to pursue retail. And so started with just a couple of local um, specialty shops and have grown from there. Um, during my, let's see, fourth summer, I actually hired a few girls to help me with farmer's markets so that we could be at multiple farmer's markets in one day. And so really kind of focused on um, getting our product out in front of as many people as possible. And then this year, the big focus has been on the retail. So as you mentioned at the, the beginning of the episode, we just launched in Whole Foods last month. Um, we started in all 18 of the Colorado locations. And so now kind of focusing more on the retail avenue. I'm up to about 25 different retail locations altogether around the state now. Um, where else are you in Colorado? Yeah, so I'm in Lucky's Market, which is a, another kind of small grocery chain. And then I'm in a lot of specialty shops, so a lot of food co-ops. Um, one of my favorite spots is Garden of the Gods Marketing Cafe. They sell amazing food in their cafe. And then in their market, they have a whole variety of local food products that you can, can pick up. Um, nice. Yeah, nice. and that's been such a great partnership, especially with those smaller specialty shops where, you know, I get to know the people who are running the um, running the shop and learning more about their products and their philosophy and making sure that that aligns with my philosophy. Um, but yeah, so, so a whole variety of different places that you can, can find my jam here in Colorado all the way from Colorado Springs up to Fort Collins. So that sounds tasty and fulfilling. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so far in your journey, Katie, which I'm uh, assuming is just the beginning, what, what have you found to be the most challenging aspect of your growth? Yeah, so as we kind of talked about already, one of the biggest challenges was just making that shift of this being a hobby to being a business because that first summer I really was just looking at it as a couple of months pursuing a hobby and then having to transition to saying like no actually this is going to be a business and needing to think about more long-term plans and how to plan for growth um, you know changing my business name was part of that I tried to streamline some of my product offerings trying to get a better understanding of who my customers actually were. I think that was one challenge, especially the first year where I want everybody to love my jam. And so people would be like, oh, do you make this? And I would say, no, but let's do it. Um, uh -huh. But recognizing that I can't do all of it, right? Um, and so needing to say, here is what I do. And now I need to find the people who are looking for that instead of trying to make everything for everyone <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all thing all things to all, all jam yeah. to all people another thing that was really challenging at the beginning was just figuring out all of the kind of legal things that i needed to do all of the different licenses that i needed to pursue and one example of that is actually determining what i could call my product um, I continue to talk about it as a jam, but technically it's a fruit spread. So the FDA has fairly stringent regulations on what can actually be called a jam or a jelly. They certainly and because do. of the lower sugar content, I'm actually not a jam. I would fall into that fruit spread category. But it took a really long time to figure that out. You know, I went to the state health department, but I would get different answers from different people and figuring out what my product was was going to determine what types of licenses and what type of testing i needed to get done on my product and so it was really confusing getting different answers because then i didn't know what it was i needed to do to be able to to sell my products in a retail setting and so it took a while to kind of find the, that right person who could help guide me down that path and ensure that i was taking all of the the necessary steps Yes, and I think it's, I mean, 
well, most people have a team of people that help them, you know, with a, with, because everybody has a different specialty. Um, you know, you need, it takes a village. I always say it takes yeah. a village to raise a business. And I think, uh, Sari Kimball is the one who introduced us uh, food business success, and and you worked with Sari as one of your one of your experts of in quotes to help you with your marketing strategy, right? And I did, yeah. So we started working together about a year, a little over a year ago. Um, and one thing that if I could go back in time and do over, I wish I had reached out to someone like Sari much earlier in the process. Um, one of the things that really got me on board with working with her was that idea of delegating up, of finding those experts who can help with those areas where I'm weak. I don't have a background in business. Everything I was doing was brand new and I enjoyed learning and I enjoyed exploring all of it, but it also took a lot longer and I probably made a lot more missteps trying to figure it out all on my own whereas working with someone like sari from the beginning could really have helped to streamline that process um and then for me too one of the biggest challenges has just been it's hard doing this on your own um and so working with sari and having somebody else who was invested in the success of my company even though she wasn't part of my company was just so hugely valuable to kind of have that other person on my team, on my side, um, helping with kind of all of those different steps related to, to growth and moving forward. Mm -hmm. Delegate up is a, is a huge, is a huge <laughs> lesson to learn. And I think a lot of mistakes that small business owners make is to think they're saving money by trying to figure it out themselves. And in the legal profession, I hear that a lot too, you know, well, I'll just figure it out myself. And I'm like, okay, well, call me later. <laughs> it'll, be more, <laughs> it'll be more expensive then, but okay. Um, anyway, yeah. but I, I mean, I have a small business too. And so I make the same mistake myself um, in different areas as I, as I go through all, I'll just read about that. And part of it, you know, there's so much available on the internet that I think there's a tendency to think, well, we you can just look it up and read about it. And, and the food business is very tricky and there's a lot of nuance to it. And it isn't something that you can just figure out on your own. Did, did um, converting from a passion to a food, a passionate food business, been making it into a business, did that take, out any of the joy, like the business angle of it? Did that re take some of the joy f from your product, making your product? I would say it didn't take any of the joy away. I am excited to say that four years later, I still really like making jam. Uh -huh. um, but I would say turning it into a business did bring just a lot of extra anxiety. I, I'm a fairly risk adverse person. I don't like making decisions. Um, but when you're a solo business owner, you have to make all of the decisions. Um, so there were just a lot of times where I was just pushed outside of my comfort zone, which can be just uncomfortable. Um, and so I would say those are definitely challenging times. But at the same time, I'm thankful for that because every time I get outside of my comfort zone, I get to learn something new that I can actually do. Um, or get to to see how much more the business can grow when I when I get uncomfortable. The more you do, the more confident you become. Yeah. Yeah. I, have there been any hidden benefits, things that you didn't expect that you're like, wow, this is awesome. I never thought this would happen. I think yeah. You probably just mentioned one, and that's gaining confidence in areas that you didn't know you could operate in. Absolutely. Um, I think other hidden benefits are just around the variety of work I'm able to do and also the flexibility that I have over my schedule. I've, I've struggled a lot in the past with kind of that normal nine to five job where I would get bored after a few months in and I had kind of learned the routine. Um, but with, with having a business, it is never boring. 
There's always something new to learn. There's always something to be doing. And so I feel like I continue to be challenged and that keeps me energized and engaged in what I'm doing, um, which has been really nice. And then also just having that flexibility over my schedule where I work a lot. <laughs> you, you work a lot when you have your own business. It's not like you get to go home at the end of the day and, and work is done. There's always something to be doing. But I also have a little bit more flexibility where I can say, you know what, it's a gorgeous morning. I'm gonna go for a hike with my dog and then I'll get work done, you know, this afternoon and tonight. And I really appreciate just being able to have more control over what my day-to-day -day looks like. Um, and it's been so much more enjoyable as a job compared to the things that I've done in the past. That's a great benefit. Yeah, not something I expected at all either. So would you say that's one of your biggest surprises or are there other surprises? Yeah, one other surprise that I had had thought about was just how far people went to seek out my product once they had tried it. Um, you know, again, I, I knew that I made a delicious jam, but I didn't expect to generate such a loyal following. And just one example of that, I had a customer my first year who moved away to Texas. And so at the time I was still producing as a cottage food and therefore I couldn't ship out of state. And so he wasn't able to keep getting my jam and he tried all of the jams at all of the farmer's markets around him in Texas, but nothing quite compared. And so he was back in Colorado for work, called me up, ordered like three or four cases to bring back with him and had even brought an extra suitcase just so he could bring jam back with him. That's and that a, was just amazing. That's <laughs> was, a great story. Yeah, uh -huh. it was just so validating of what I was doing to know that this is something that someone is gonna go so far out of their way to make sure that this is gonna be you know, on their table. Oh, that's amazing. Now, mm -hmm. I can't wait to try it. Tell us where to find you and how I know now now you can ship out of state. So how can I, I order can. some and where can listeners find you? Yeah. So if you're here in Colorado, um, you can find me in any of the Whole Food locations here in Colorado, as well as a number of specialty shops. And the best way to find that is to head to my website, which is blueowlpreserves.com. I have a full list there of all of the retail locations as well as events. So this month I've got a lavender festival coming up. In August I'll be at a peach festival. So there still are opportunities to come meet and buy from me in person. And then if you're out of state, my website, blueowlpreserves.com, has an online store. So you can shop from all of my different flavors and I can ship it anywhere here in the United States. Awesome. Can't wait. Do you have a personal favorite, Katie? I do. I am quite a fan of the blueberry rhubarb. That's exactly the one I would pick. Yes. Yeah. It is. Okay. That's great. It's a good one. <laughs> well, I can't wait to try it. So, well, before we leave, Katie, and thank you so much for having this conversation with me. It's really your business, your path, your journey is really interesting. And, you know, I love the idea of low sugar jam because life without jam is kind of miserable and uh, yeah. <laughs> so a, a healthy, organic, low sugar where you can actually taste the fruit is good with me and I can't wait to try it. I'm, the answer to this might be a little obvious, but I ask everybody that I talk with, how does what you do affect what's on people's plate and I mean, the obvious short answer is you get a delicious jam, but but in a bigger picture, bigger scheme of things, how does how does what you do affect what what's on people's plate? Yeah, well, like you said, the obvious is getting a healthy jam on people's plate that's lower in sugar, that's using organic ingredients, so that we're supporting farmers that are employing organic practices. But then I'd say another piece, um, and this kind of harkens back to my days of hosting dinners, is I put together recipes that use jam in kind of creative, unique ways and share those each month in a monthly newsletter. And then those are also all up on my website. But my hope with sharing those recipes is 
that I'm able to inspire joy around cooking food and sharing food with the people that you love um, so that I can kind of continue to do that um, even though I might not be there in the kitchen with you. That's an awesome mission. That's so <laughs> great. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you yeah. for spending time with us. And again, can't wait to try that blue owl preserves jam. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on today, Susan. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about my story and my background and my business. And my absolute pleasure. We'll talk again, Katie. Thank you. All right.